I should uh, say I'm a little overwhelmed because I'm used to seeing people I know in the audience who always kind of walked in that I do know. <laughs> uh, but most of you are strangers, and I may surprise some of you a bit. I got into the planning game in September of 1967. Uh, I was a young teacher at Yale, and for my second class I was going to teach about commercial development, and I made a list of all the players that make a shopping center. And I started laying out what their interests were, and they went to bore. Who wants to get a list of players and what they're interested in? And so I thought, well, how do you do this? Well, you do it by making a game. Let's design a shopping center. And this is one of my classes, uh, and we have been playing the planning game uh, since 1967. Now, when I say we, the difference is that three years later, I got into the planning game. Um, and it was quite a shock, because I wasn't able to program what everybody did. Uh, <laughs> and life wasn't the way it worked in a classroom. The players in the planning game are the most important, and there are lots of them. Community activists, public officials, lending institutions, architects, all kinds of people. Notice that list contains nobody who calls himself a city planner, but all these people are also city planners. They're responsible for shaping the environment that we're in. And I think it's very important. Take, for example, oh, that's right. Hold it up high. There we go. This is Baltimore, and there was a highway planned to go across uh, the harbor in Baltimore. And those of you who know Baltimore know there's no highway there. Well, uh, interstate. Highway 95, I-95 was going to go this way, cut off the harbor, and go right through Fells Point, which is the neighborhood over here. And that is where Barbara Mikulski lived. And she said later that at a local meeting, I jumped up on a table and I cried, the British couldn't take Fells Point, and God damn it if we're going to let the State Roads Commission take <laughs> Fells Point. And she put together a coalition of Polish Americans from Fells Point and African Americans from other neighbors through which this went and stopped the highway. That is planning by a community activist. She's now Senator uh, of the United States and a rather important figure uh, in, in the Senate at that. So it's a, important to know that there are all these players and there's a whole chapter about different kinds of players the players have to play by the rules, and they're very important rules. I'm not going to go through them. That's in the next chapter. But there are rules of economics, rules of politics. Uh, by the way, some of you are architects in the audience. What do you think the rules of architecture and design are? None. There is no right answer to that. But if you can't finance the building, it's not going to get built. And if you need public approval and you don't have the support of the constituency, it's not going to happen. That's not true of design. And the other thing to remember is the world keep, keeps changing. And what might make sense in 1950 makes no sense in 1990 and will make no sense in 2090. So you keep having to adjust to these various rules. Now, one of the things that people think about planning is that it's about plans. My favorite quote about that is from Dwight Eisenhower, who said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And in fact, plans that change nothing are totally worthless. We don't need them. There are lots of them. You can find them collecting dust on library shelves. You, if you're interested in what might have been, you might look at a book that has these plans. But if they don't change anything, I don't think they're anything about planning. Because planning is about a process of changing things. Minneapolis. 
I'm going to go back so you can see again. That's 1913. It changed in 1947. It looked like that. When I first saw it in 1979, that's the same street corner in the same spot. It looked like that. And a few years later, I took this picture. The buildings are different. The street is different. It's used in a different way. And if you don't pay attention to the fact that cities change like that, you can't be in the planning game, because that's central to everything. Well, having said that, what is planning? The best definition I can find of planning comes from Walter Moody. Probably nobody has ever heard of Walter Moody in the room. Uh, he was the first uh, managing director of the Chicago Plan Commission that was established after Daniel Burnham's document was printed in 1909. And Moody said, planning is a simple common sense procedure to make conditions more livable by investing in public improvements with intelligence and foresight rather than a haphazard, uncoordinated manner. A street widening unrelated to any other improvement or purpose or a civic center created without reference to everything else in the city is not the result of planning. He called that development unplanning in 1919 in a book that he wrote. So I asked myself, what approach should you take? And I believe in taking the public realm approach. What's the public realm? It's what we all own, all of us. It's our, the streets and the parks and the squares and the public buildings. That's our property. We have control over that. And if we invest in those facilities and improve them or put in new ones, we can change things. And I believe that when you make these investments, you must simultaneously satisfy the needs of the present, stimulate a private market reaction, and those of you who are my students in the room can hear public action that generates a widespread and sustained private market reaction is what I call planning in the, Amer in the American city. It also creates a framework around which further development can grow and accommodate the needs of future generations. When it does that, it's successful planning. There are four cities and four public entrepreneurs, I call them, uh, that uh, probably changed more about the city they worked in than any other public entrepreneurs. I use the word because only this gentleman, Edmund Bacon, called himself a city planner. Uh, he was actually trained as an architect. This gentleman called them commies. He hated them. Uh, Burnham was an architect, and Osman was the chief executive officer of the Paris region, appointed uh, to run everything in Paris. Uh, these four people changed four cities at different times with different political uh, context in each case. And I think it's interesting to look at how they all worked. And in fact, the bulk of the planning game is devoted to chapters on these four cities and these four people and the other people that worked with them because they were not the only people that change. In fact, the subtitle uh, of the chapter on New York is, it wasn't all Robert Moses. So let's take Paris as a start. Osman was appointed uh, the prefect of the Seine in 1853. At the time, the city was in about a million people, 12 arrondis small. This is the Ile Cité, you will recognize Notre Dame Cathedral there. And if you think that you can move goods and services through that collection of streets and buildings. Uh, I don't. Imagine 350,000 people going to work every morning or trying to feed a million people by moving produce through a city that looked like that. This is an actual photograph of what Paris looked like at the time, and it was described in a contemporary uh, writing as many of the city streets were described, quote, as mere trenches, dirty and always humid, with infected water. 
people move through them, foot in the gutter, nose in infection, and the eye struck at each corner with the most repulsive filth. And you can imagine, that's what the street was like. Uh, you cannot be a modern econ economy with an infrastructure that looks like that. And everybody in Paris knew it, and they had been trying to change it for some time when Osman was appointed by Napoleon III uh, to do something. And as you will see in my book, it wasn't that he pointed there and said a boulevard happened. Let's take a look. The first thing they needed was a water supply system. None of the city of Paris was supplied by water. That is to say the water came uh, in carts uh, with barrels and you went there and you bought water from the water cart or else it was pumped up from the Seine River which was of course polluted so uh, it was dangerous there was also no sewer system I want to go back because I think that's the water supply system it, uh, to give you a sense of how big that is we're talking about delivering 80 million gallons a day at a water pressure of 230 feet above sea level. That's so it could go above the sixth story, which is about all that you could probably take a baby carriage or a stroller up if you live there. It's 173 kilometers of conduits, 16 kilometers of aqueducts, viaducts, and all bringing water from uh, rivers which were not polluted into the city and bringing them into reservoirs which they built for the purpose. They also needed to have a sewer system. They were very clever. They decided they dumped the sewage in the River Seine after it had flowed through Paris. So if you look there, you can see where the, the sewage goes. But that meant that uh, there was a possibility of bringing water into the city that was not polluted, and Osman spent 10 years fighting, without the help of Napoleon III, I might add, uh, to get this uh, to happen and finally did. And then there are the streets. These are the boulevards that Osman was responsible for. At the time that Paris began uh, as a modern city, as I'll show you, there were hardly any of them. Uh, if you look carefully uh, at where these roads are, they come from the entry points of the city uh, to bridges, to public markets, to railroad stations. They're what any traffic engineer would have done. And it's quite interesting as you look at them because uh, here is Paris uh, in 1853. That's the wall. There's the Bois de Boulogne and the Bois de Vincennes. Those were two royal hunting grounds that uh, Napoleon III donated to the city of Paris. The first Napoleon, uh, built the Champs Elysees and the disengagement there for the Rivoli. That's all that there was. Now, watch what happens. The first thing that the system did was to create something they call in French the Grand Croisé, a north south boulevard, that's the Boulevard Saint Michel and the Boulevard Sebastopol, and the Rue de Rivoli, which gets extended to the east side of the city. Then there were the walls of Paris, the first set of which were being turned into boulevards before uh, Osman came in, but eventually you had a series of ring roads. This is after Osman. This is the peripheric highway around the city. So all of a sudden you have a way of getting around Paris. I lived in Paris for a year uh, as a young architect, and I can tell you I had no idea that this structure existed. That but uh, somehow you get around Paris and you can't figure out that this is part of the reason for it. Uh, and these uh, are not all straight. That is um, a conceit of the Beaux-Arts. They twist and they turn and they go to destinations of importance, whether it's a railroad station, as you see there, uh, or a bridge. And as you can see, they are not all straight. Uh, they have problems of relocation even then. If you're going to have a modern economy, you also have to have public markets. 
and a whole section of Paris was cleared out and rebuilt as a public market. It was begun before uh, Osman was appointed and then completely changed when he uh, came to office. It's part of the beginning of the reconstruction of a city center. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, this is another shot so you can see what the market was like. It doesn't exist. In case you're wondering how much was demolished by that point, we're talking about tearing down something on the order of 12,000 structures. You cannot create this modern economy without destruction and without heavy relocation. And that relocation began to be part of the political opposition to Osman, which eventually brought his downfall in 1870. He also rebuilt the entire administrative center of the city, tried to be a modern industrial economy without rebuilding the area around the city hall, without reconstructing the La Cité with the Ministry of Justice and the police department and the main hospital, and the left bank gets rebuilt uh, for the Sorbonne. So you have judicial, educational, administrative center of Paris completely rebuilt within the structure of the Grand Croisé. And parks, not just the two big ones, which were completely rebuilt, but three large neighborhood parks. And uh, when you put them together with a couple of dozen squares, which are these dots, and the squares are really small parks, ranging from an acre to six acres, uh, in each neighborhood, and the boulevards, you have a public realm that is extraordinary. And anybody who's been to Paris uh, thinks of it as a city of light, not by accident, and a city of greenery, also not by accident. It is a public realm that's used by all kinds of people at all times of the day and night and for all kinds of purposes. It is not just for moving vehicles in the roadway. And anybody who's been to Paris and has sat in a cafe or bought a newspaper or picked up a date knows exactly what I'm talking about. And it's high time that we stop thinking of our uh, public arteries as existing only for trucks and buses, much less private automobiles. Today, Paris is the center of a region of nearly 12 million people. Uh, it can sustain itself because the basic public realm that was created by Osman and his colleagues, and you can read about them too in the chapter on Paris, can support a modern industrial economy. Okay, let's say that you want to do that. And you're in Chicago, and Chicago is also a city of about a million people in 1900. <clears throat> and this is the shore of Lake Michigan in 1892. It's a dump. It's polluted. How do you go about changing things? They already knew about Paris. More than that, uh, they changed the city completely. And they did it by going through a process that was creating a constituency to change that, establishing a planning entity to figure out what to do, deciding on an agenda for the city, testing the agenda's validity, creating an appealing image, following the rules of economics and politics, gaining public uh, acceptance for that agenda, establishing an implementing entity, and then getting it approved and financed. And that took a period of years roughly from 1906 until 1929 when uh, they also succumbed to some of the political problems. Lest you think that it's all the creation of Daniel Burnham, it wasn't. He was a member of the Commercial Club of Chicago that uh, actually hired him to come up with this. They met for two and a half years, once a week, the main central committee. And then there were individual subcommittees that also met once a week. For two and a half years, they included most of the industrialists uh, in Chicago that had power, uh, the 
uh, owner of the Chicago Tribune. They invited the mayor, the governor, various uh, members of uh, the Board of Aldermen. Uh, there is a picture of Burnham showing some of his drawings. Um, and at the end of the process, they published a book. This is the plan of Chicago, uh, much of which, uh, when I first saw it uh, in Vincent Scully's class at Yale as an undergraduate, uh, I knew hadn't happened. I looked at where did all those diagonals come from? They're not in Chicago. I, of course, dismissed the plan. I was wrong. Uh, then there was that. That was uh, the new centerpiece which was going to outdo the square in front of the opera that Osman had built in Paris because Paris was the inspiration. That's 800 feet high. New City Hall for Chicago. They didn't build that. They didn't have continuous cornice lines like this and they didn't have public squares like that and they didn't build the diagonal boulevards. In case you don't recall, Chicago has wide streets and a grid. It didn't need to put boulevards through there connecting the city. It already had that grid. And therefore, this Paris notion made no sense in Chicago. Nevertheless, they widened great numbers of the streets. Uh, they didn't need to do what Osman did in Paris, but they did need to uh, reconstruct the city. And for example, uh, this is Michigan Avenue in 1915. This is the traffic. This is just at the edge of what is now Grant Park, and that's looking north. Uh, just imagine you're in a city uh, about the size of Paris in 1850, uh, and you also are the center of the eco economy of the Midwest, and you think you're going to be the biggest city in the world shortly. And they did, by the way. Um, there had been lots of plans of what to do. This is a plan of 1905, which has Michigan Avenue being widened and going under the Chicago River in a tunnel. This is, a 19, this is the one in the plan of Chicago in 1909, but there were lots of these plans. Uh, this is Burnham's image uh, in the plan of Chicago. I saw this in Scully's class. I said, well, Chicago doesn't look like that. In fact, building the bridge across the Chicago River and widening uh, Michigan Avenue to 140 feet uh, is a central uh, feature of changing uh, Chicago forever. Uh, they didn't stop with printing a plan. They had a lobbying effort, a substantial lobbying effort. Um, this is a document that the Chicago Plan Commission, which more than 300 appointees of the mayor uh, were involved with, uh, that promoted the plan of Chicago in a little brochure. The brochure was distributed to every property owner in the city of Chicago, plus all renters who paid more than $25 in rent on a monthly basis. And they didn't stop with that. They produced the Wacker Manual. That is the eighth grade textbook for the Chicago school system. Now imagine uh, your child coming home, having read that in the eighth grade, uh, asking about the plan of Chicago. Uh, that's the kind of promotion that they did, and I talk more about it in the book. This is the widening of uh, Michigan Avenue in uh, north of the river. Uh, there you see 1930. In the decade after the, build, the bridge was built, all those buildings in black were built. And the change is remarkable because if you actually look, this is what it looked like right after uh, the Chicago Tribune building was built. There you see Grand Park isn't even a park yet. The widened Michigan Avenue, most of this isn't filled in yet. And uh, by the time that they did, this is the edge along Lake Michigan of that area that I just showed you in 1915. And a photograph I took recently in the same spot. Uh, that's the Gold Coast. Uh, and. Today, this is North Michigan Avenue. It's the main shopping street of the Midwest. Uh, it, of course, also drew away all the shoppers from State Street. Uh, it wasn't all good. Uh, but they didn't know that was going to happen. They wanted to create something 
knew, and they did, and they changed Chicago uh, forever by extending it northward. So we come to New York. New York uh, is about to become, in 1920, the largest city in the world. Uh, it knows about Chicago. It knows about Paris. And uh, everybody pretty well agreed about what needed to be done. The public realm needed to be extended to accommodate an even larger population that already existed in New York. Uh, and, and the region, which was obviously where it was going to grow. And that the quality of life for the residents had to be improved. And the way you did this was the same way they did it in Chicago and the same way they did it in Paris. Improve the public realm. Now, uh, because there was an agreed upon agenda in New York, you didn't have to go through this planning process, and New York didn't. But we couldn't do this without some new uh, institutions. Because if you look at the public realm as it existed uh, in New York, and this is just New York City, as you'll see momentarily, we're going to expand to New Jersey and Long Island. Uh, that's 1910, and we began investing in that public realm over time. By 1930, you have these parkways and new parks. By 1940, you have more parkways, bridges, tunnels, and more parks. By 1950, that's increased more. Then come the highways. Uh, just before the interstate highway system, more bridges and tunnels. 1970, 1980. You can't do this in New York easily. We needed to invent institutions to make that possible. And we invented a series of them, the most important of which is the first one, the Port Authority of New York. I say that with a sigh, as I do, because I... Uh, had to deal with the Port Authority uh, over the World Trade Center. But it was established in 1921 with the ability to do anything it wanted in the state of New Jersey or the state of New York without the approval of the local legislative bodies. And they figured out very quickly how they could make this work. They charged people for using their tunnels, their bridges, and their highways. They paid tolls. And that was a mechanism that allowed them to sell bonds without ever going to back to the state legislature and pay for the Holland Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel, the George Washington Bridge, and so on. Uh, three years later, the state of New York uh, consolidated its park system into 11 regional park systems. And those 11 uh, regions had a commission and a chair for each of those commissions, and one of them was, the one in Long Island, was chaired by a young reformer who had never worked in government before, uh, Robert Moses. And he started building parks and parkways on Long Island using the same principle that had been used by the Port Authority with the uh, tolls. He later was appointed, not in 1929, but 1934, by LaGuardia to be the chairman of the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. Um, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, the same thing, we had five borough parks departments. They were consolidated by state legislation, and LaGuardia appointed him the chair of the uh, parks department. At the same time, LaGuardia created the New York City Housing Authority, which eventually produced housing for persons of low income to the tune of 180,000 apartments. Robert Moses had nothing to do with this. In fact, they were bitter enemies. He considered them dangerous lefties. Uh, and then there was the Mayor's Committee on Slum Clearance, which, as I will explain to you later, had much less impact than you think, uh, to which Mayor O'Dwyer uh, appointed Robert Moses. So you have all of that being uh, created, owned, and operated by the Port Authority, or leased to the Port Authority. 
And then you have a city like this. And when you look at, and this is Mott Haven in the Bronx, and you look at that, uh, I don't see anything there except the stub end of, no, I don't even see the stub end of the Triborough Bridge. None of this was done by Robert Moses. Uh, those are public housing projects. Uh, uh, the roadways were built by the borough presidents uh, to the degree that they were the bridges the same way. And yet, this is the man that we think did all of this. Uh, and he did a great deal. And it's important to understand. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to improve the graphics. Uh, this is the difference on Long Island. 1924, no miles of parkway, 133 when he steps down as the chairman of that authority in 1963. No miles of public beach, 24 when he steps down, and 15 uh, major public parks. They're all on that map of Long Island, and I threw in uh, some of uh, New York City as well. Uh, these are some of the facilities which he built. Uh, the Sunken Meadow Parkway, uh, Hempstead Lake State Park, that's the Southern State Parkway going through it, uh, and of course the Pièce de Résistance, Jones Beach, uh, which on a nice day has about 100,000 Long Islanders uh, in the summer. Uh, it is uh, used almost entirely by people uh, who live on Long Island. It was built as part of the Long Island parks system. He also, as Parks Commissioner of New York, did a tremendous amount as well. Uh, the parks acreage was more than doubled. Uh, the number of public, uh, miles of public beach went from 1 to 18 uh, in every borough uh, but Manhattan. Uh, miles of parkway uh, went up. Uh, playgrounds went from 119 to, one, to 777 and public swimming pools from 0 to 15. All those red dots are those public swimming pools. And if you think that they're minor, uh, and most of you live in New York and know better, let me show you one of them. Uh, this is Highbridge in northern Manhattan. Uh, this is an awesome expansion of the public realm. And if you're trying to improve the quality of life for the people who live in the New York metropolitan area, it is enormous. Playgrounds, 777 playgrounds. They're also everywhere in the city. And then there are the bridges and the tunnels and the highways. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about all of this. And if you look, these are all of the uh, tunnels and highways that Moses built as chairman of the Triborough Bridge uh, and Tunnel Authority. He was appointed in 1934 by Fiorello LaGuardia. At that time, uh, the Triborough Bridge had been in construction for five years. It was approved with an allocation of $5 million by the city council on the day the stock market crashed in 1929. And five years later, there was nothing to be seen except some uh, anchors at either end. And uh, at the uh, ribbon cutting where they recommenced construction, uh, Mayor LaGuardia announced uh, that, uh, well, let me explain. The original plan for the bridge was something that looked like the Manhattan Bridge. Or it was a stone bridge, Gothic. You can imagine what they, it looked like. And Moses hired away from the Port Authority uh, the engineer Eamon, who had designed the George Washington Bridge. Uh, Eamon stripped it of all of the stone and all the decorations. What we have today is a bridge by him. And at the ribbon cutting, Fiorello LaGuardia said, we are going to build this bridge out of steel, spelled S-T-E-E-L, not S-T-E-A-L. Uh, and uh, the Verrazano Bridge is just one example, and there are all these parkways that he built uh, as well. The Shore Parkway in Brooklyn, and by the way, like he, uh, Paris, these aren't simple roadways. They are also parks. Uh, there's a 
uh, an area for bicycle riders and joggers and people sitting in the sun. It is not just a traffic artery. Neither are most of the rest of them. Uh, so I thought I would stop uh, and talk a little bit about one of the great legends. Um, Robert Moses, if you read anything uh, in any publication at the moment, will tell you about all the highways he built. Now let me shock you. Robert Moses built no highways whatsoever. He built parkways. And uh, one day, in writing the planning game, I sort of wondered, how does the Parks Commissioner get to build highways? Being an old municipal employee, I went to the city charter. Borough presidents built highways. They built highways under the 38 charter. They were, that was taken away from them only in 1961, when Robert Moses wasn't any longer in the government. OK. The legend is that Robert Moses wanted to bash a highway through Brooklyn Heights. So I started wondering. Uh, how did this all happen? The first thing I did was to look in the New York Times, and I discovered the announcement of the highways by the Queensboro president in 1938-39 and the Brooklyn borough president. The question was, how do you get through Brooklyn? Um, there was going to be, they thought, a bridge here. It turned out to be a tunnel. And the Hamilton Expressway here. There's the Brooklyn Bridge, and you've got to get connect them somehow. OK. The obvious thing to do was to connect them on Court Street and take all that stuff out. That didn't happen. The borough president didn't allow it. In fact, uh, it went here in Cobble Hill. And you know where it is, all of you, because you go to Brooklyn. OK, if that's where you are, and you're trying to get through uh, Brook Brooklyn to the Brooklyn Bridge and then past it to the Brooklyn-Queens connecting highway, how could you go? On Court Street, no way. Too much relocation, too much demolition, too expensive. Or you could come from uh, the depressed highway here and cut all across the Planning Avenue and go this way also. Too much cost, too much relocation. There's another way you could go. You could go right through Brooklyn Heights, which is what the legend is, that this is being proposed by Moses. Moses isn't building the highway. The Brooklyn Borough President is. The Brooklyn P Borough President is no way going to risk his career by going that way, nor would his engineers, nor could they pay for it. So the obvious thing, well, there's another one. Uh-uh, that wouldn't work either. Too much relocation, too expensive. Also, all the wealthy people in Brooklyn live on that street. No way that's going to happen. The obvious place is Thurman Street. Uh, but Furman Street is down below the heights. And on the other side of Furman Street are piers. And those piers, uh, in 1939, 1940, 1941, were being actively used, and we're about to go into World War II. That's what the piers look like. And that's not 1941, that's five years ago, before the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, so I was very curious. Where did all of this come from? What was built is, as you know, a double, triple cantilever, the park on top, and then two roadways. So I started looking, and uh, I discovered that uh, in 1942, Robert Moses was appointed by Fiero Guardia to the City Planning Commission, on which I once served. And one of the things the Planning Commission does is it approves streets and parks. So now he has his foot in the door with these highways for the first time. Uh, there uh, was uh, opposition in the Brooklyn Heights Association to creating this roadway. And I found in the archives a drawing of the roadway that you see there, the triple cantilever, by a man named Earl Andrews who was an engineer, uh, had his own company. I'd never heard of Earl Andrews. Uh, so I looked him up. Earl Andrews' previous job was as the chief engineer of the 
World's Fair of 1939, run by Robert Moses. Before that, he was the chief engineer of the Parks Department, run by Robert Moses. So, uh, how did you get this thing? In 1943, uh, that drawing appears in February. In March, there's a public hearing at the Planning Commission. I got a hold of the transcript, and in it, the head of the Brooklyn Heights Association says that they don't want an elevated highway on Furman Street because they like to go out walking and looking at the view of Lower Manhattan. His testimony is interrupted by Commissioner Moses, who says, that's not a promenade, those are stub ends of streets. Uh, the Planning Commission approves Mr. Andrews' triple-decker. The next uh, time that it, you really see any activity is the announcement that this new triple-decker roadway is going to open. The announcement's made by the Brooklyn Borough President, who also says that the roadway between Atlantic <coughs> Avenue and the Brooklyn Navy Yard will be the most parked stretch of highway in the world. No mention of Robert Moses. Obviously, he had something to do with this. And you can see his tracks all the way through this. He certainly built the park on top, and some of the other, and all the other parks that are along the way. But it isn't just Robert Moses. And a lot of what you think, is, and this is uh, the grand public promenade uh, that Moses obviously had in mind. But the same thing is true of his work as urban renewal. He's appointed chairman of the mayor's committee on slum clearance in 1948 by Mayor O'Dwyer. And you've all heard about how successful he was at destroying neighborhoods. This is one of the early plans that uh, he put out. He produced these brochures that announced how they're going to rebuild the neighborhoods. Um, and here you can see they have financial analysis, they have uh, architectural designs. I'm not even showing you the floor plans of the buildings. Do any of you know where that is? That is Soho. It never happened. Robert Moses proposed 53 urban renewal projects. 27 of them were not approved. So much for the all-powerful Mr. Moses. Unfortunately, one of his biographers bought the legend hook, line, and sinker. Then I asked myself, well, what was the effect of this urban renewal, besides destroying the lives of the people who were moved out and providing decent housing for the people who moved in. Uh, the total amount built while he was the chair of the uh, Slum Clearance Committee is 8,900 units of housing. During that period, 391,000 was built in the city of New York. The Committee on Slum Clearance was responsible for 2%. So I think we need to rethink just what Robert Moses did and did not do. It doesn't mean he had no impact and that the Slum Clearance Committee didn't. This is the place that probably changed New York the most uh, and the only one of his urban renewal projects that did. This is the site of Lincoln Center and 4,200 units of housing and public schools and the headquarters of the National Red Cross until it was re replaced. But if you look at it, these are public investments, the Coliseum and two Michelama projects that uh, were publicly assisted. This is Fordham Law School, there's Lincoln Center, there's the rest of the urban renewal area, including the school and the housing. That's all in red. Everything else that you see there in black is private construction. This changed the city of New York totally. No one's, except in this book, ever seen this map before. I also took uh, a look at the four blocks between Lincoln Center, that's 62nd to 66th Street, between Columbus Avenue and Central Park. And the change in the assessment between 1950 and 19, 2012 is $650 million, just those four blocks. Think about all of the city services that are being paid out of that money. That brings me to the fourth of these cities, uh, and then we'll come to, to an end. Uh, and that is 
downtown Philadelphia, which was reinvented by Edmund Bacon, the only man who actually called himself a city planner of these four. And that's a photograph of him uh, working on uh, Society Hill. How did he reinvent downtown Philadelphia? Uh, first thing you have to understand is that in 1950, when he became the head of the planning department and executive director of the planning commission, um, there was a railroad which came into downtown Philadelphia and stopped at Broad Street with a big station. There you see what it looked like. It went all the way to City Hall. And then there was on the east side of the city the Dock Street Market, which was a produce market. And starting at 4 in the morning, the trucks began to move in uh, and the vermin with the produce and so on. He believed those two things had to be removed and that you needed to implant a new residential population in downtown Philadelphia, which at that point had only one downtown neighborhood, Rittenhouse Square. Today, we understand that in-town residential neighborhoods are the beginning and end of the life of a city. We are in a part of New York that is in the middle of a major revival because of housing construction not because of Wall Street. And there are other parts of cities, whether you go to the Pearl District in Portland or you go to the uh, Third Ward in Milwaukee, we have a movement back into the city that is substantial everywhere. Nobody thought about that in 1950 except Bacon. Uh, Bacon had no money. He had no agency to carry things out like Moses or Osman. Uh, he had no official position, uh, but his ideas, like Burnham's, were extremely uh, powerful. And in 1947, he and a group of his associates uh, put together an exhibition, probably more important than he was a man named Oscar Stonerhoff, an architect, uh, who was at that time Louis Kahn's partner. Uh, 400,000 people came to see the show in two months' time uh, at Gimbel's department store. That's the kind of promotion that they went through to promote what the new Philadelphia would be like. It was called the Better Philadelphia Exhibition. This is like the eighth grade textbook in Chicago. If you don't know how to promote the vision of the future, it's not going to happen. You do need the vision, and it's got to be practical. So. Uh, among the things that they did was to put price tags on everything, including a firehouse. And they explained that it's like doing your own budget. And believe me, when I was a young man working in the planning department and had to do the capital budget for the parks department, I began to understand what that was all about. <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, the planning commission doesn't do that anymore. Uh, this is the model that flipped over the old Philadelphia being replaced with the new Philadelphia. You can imagine uh, housewives going to Gimbel's and seeing the show and then dragging their kids and their uh, spouses. Uh, it had quite an effect. The first thing that happened was the Broad Street Station. Uh, Bacon finally forced, and this, it's a long story, it began in the 1920s, but Bacon finally got the Pennsylvania Railroad to agree to live only with the 30th Street Station, which is the one we use now, and tear this down. And it became a real estate development project. Not very beautiful. Uh, that's called, it's called Penn Central. And it changed Philadelphia forever, as I'll show you momentarily. Taking out the Dot Street Market was central to uh, enlivening the east side of downtown. And they proposed to put in beacons announcing the future of Philadelphia. The beacons uh, were apartment houses that were uh, developed by William Zeckendorf and his architect, I.M. Pei. This is the plan. Um, it has a series of landmarks which you see here in red. Uh, another map made just for the book. Uh, connecting up about 700 uh, late 18th and early 19th century row houses, some new buildings, the three towers by Pei, which you see there, and the three 
Towers became the beacon announcing the revival of downtown living in Philadelphia. Uh, we're talking about the early 60s now. Uh, the connections between these various uh, historical uh, sites were a series of greenways. This is the site of one of them. You can see St. Peter's Church in the distance. It became a greenway, which you see here. Actually, that's Ed Bacon uh, in a raincoat walking <coughs> down the greenway, and two of my, three of my students walking behind him. This is what Society Hill looks like today, if you haven't been there. It's quite extraordinary. It's probably the most beautiful urban renewal project in the country, with the possible exception of one by Mies van der Rohe in Detroit. Uh, but it's, it's an amazing place. It changed Philadelphia. Uh, the other thing uh, that happened was a young uh, planner in Philadelphia one day told Bacon that he ought to connect up the subway and the two suburban rail lines. And Bacon thought this was a great idea and for the next uh, 20 years promoted it. They finally did it. And on top of it sits something called the gallery. This is the connection at Market East. That's subway and rail. And it goes to the two suburban rail lines. And on top of it is a shopping mall. Uh, it's a shopping mall for working class people. And so some people don't think it's successful. But it's usually filled with people when I go there. Uh, that's what it looks like. And there is life on uh, East Market Street. Uh, and these are new hotels that got built. This is the PSFS building that's been converted into another hotel. This is near a convention center which they built. The result is that downtown Philadelphia, which once looked like this with the Broad Street uh, railroad line going to the station, now looks like that. That's the same spot. And there is a map that shows you, in red, the public investments and all the private construction that happened afterwards. That is what I call a widespread and sustained private market reaction to public investment. And that is what I think planning is about. And so I would ask you, as you think about the planning game, and some of you are in it in this room, and some of you may be thinking of getting into it, that there are some very important things that you always have to do that they can do. Present a vision, promote the vision, generate widespread support, minimize active opposition, obtain legislative sanction, guarantee the financing they had urban renewal funds for that, engage an effective implementing entity. Uh, if you have nobody to carry it out, it won't work. They had a redevelopment agency in Philadelphia, and then let go because it's going to be produced by other people than the people th that you think. And when you look at what happened in these four cities, which I describe in much greater detail in the book, mm -hmm. you will see that the changes that were begun in the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century or the end of the 20th century turned out to be not only sustainable, but changed the quality of life in each of those four cities. And uh, so I ask myself at the beginning and the end of the book a question. Alexander Hamilton, in the first Federalist paper, asked the question whether we're capable of establishing good government through reflection and choice, or destined to make political decisions through accident and force. And by the end of the book, I state unequivocally that since planning is about change, it has to be that we discuss whether we are capable of making cities better through uh, accident and force or reflection and choice. And the answer that I give is both. That is the essence of the plan. And I'd be happy to answer any questions.